good afternoon. My name is Trudy Jacobson, and I chair the amazing group from the libraries who organize the Campus Conversation Series, and we're really happy to see you all here today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel Dressler, who is presenting the third and last Campus Conversation in Standish of the fall semester. Her talk is entitled Medieval Maps in the Bayou of Embroidery, a Shared Historical Discourse of Place and Space. As a side note, I have to say that I am extremely excited about her talk as I just visited Bayeux, the Bayeux Tapestry or Embroidery for the second time this past June. Dr. Dressler, a specialist in medieval art, is associate professor and chair of the University at Albany's Department of Art and Art History. I'm, I'm not chair any longer. I'm past chair. Past chair. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sarah now has an honor. Okay. I am sorry. Uh, she has published extensively on the relatively unexplored subject of medieval tomb sculpture and issues of status and gender, including the book of armor and men in medieval art. <coughs> The Chivalric Rhetoric of Three English Knights Effigies, published in 2004. She has also published on material, materiality and identity in English medieval alabaster sculpture. Professor Dressler's most recent research focuses on medieval visualizations of history, especially as featured in the, embro the Bayer embroidery, and in medieval maps, such as the Hereford Mapa Mundi. Dr. Dressler is the founder of Different Visions, a journal of new perspectives on medieval art, an online open access journal devoted to progressive approaches to the study of medieval art. She earned her PhD in art history from Columbia University. Welcome, Rachel. And thank you, Trudy, for inviting me to talk this afternoon. I did want to preface this by saying you'll hear me refer to the Bayou Embroidery. You may be more uh, familiar with it as the Bayou Tapestry. There is, though, it is actually an embroidery, not a tapestry, and there, it is a feminist issue as to whether you refer to it as tapestry and embroidery, and I can talk about that after the lecture if you'd like me to. Um, so the focus of my current research involves a comparison between two examples of medieval visual production. Is there any way to kind of lower the lights a little bit so the images are a little more, they pop a little more, if you will? Um, the Bayou Embroidery, which you see a section of right here. And medieval world maps. This is the Hereford map of Mundi here. This is the Poitinger table here. I'll be talking about both. Um, and the way they each employ markers of space and place to present and construct history. This is the Bayou embroidery as it's installed today currently at Bayou. The late 11th century Bayou embroidery was produced sometime in the late 11th century, probably at the monastery of St. Augustine in Canterbury, England. And it has been the subject of an enormous bibliography that stretches all the way back to the 18th century. This 230 foot long and 24 inch high embroidered strip of linen, which is composed of nine unequal panels, um, visually narrates the uh, events leading up to the Norman conquest, beginning with Harold Godwinson's, whoops, sorry, uh, mission of some sort. Here you see him with Edward the Confessor, the second to last Anglo-Saxon king. From Edward the Confessor, the penultimate Anglo-Saxon king, and ending with William the Conqueror's victory over the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings in October 1066. And I should tell you that this is not the original ending of the tapestry. It's quite damaged here. It's clear that we've lost material. Um, the possibility, one of the major possibilities is that the tapestry, or the embroidery rather, ended with an image of William enthroned as King of England to parallel the beginning image of Edward enthroned as King of England. Um, the, many, uh, the many studies of this work have engaged issues such as its original patron or patrons, its original display environment, its original purpose, 
and its possible either pro-Norman or pro-Anglo-Saxon perspective. And this has all resulted in uh, many intriguing and convincing possibilities. It's still open for debate. But my own research study is not really focused on this already well-considered ground. I'm instead interested in placing this extraordinary work in the context of another arena of visual production, medieval mapping practice, examples of which I can show you are on the screen. Um, I propose that the Bayou Embroidery shares with such survivals as the Poitinger table, which runs along the bottom of this slide, a medieval copy of either an ancient or a 9th century original map of the ancient Roman road system, and the early 14th century Hereford map of Mundi, or world map, uh, an, and that all of these productions share an analogous Western medieval approach to organizing history around geography. Now, when considering medieval maps, we have to abandon our modern assumptions that a map's primary purpose is to show us how to get from A to B, or to present an accurate and objective depiction of a particular area. Although modern maps are also idealized or schematized depictions following overt or unacknowledged agendas, medieval maps perform many functions, such as providing a means of spiritual pilgrimage without having to leave home, charting the history of God's plan for salvation, or organizing knowledge about the world. What they were not intended to do, at least until the later 14th century, was to provide accurate travel directions. Um, in exploring a shared historical discourse between textiles and maps, I've benefited from recent insights into place and space produced within multiple humanistic disciplines. And I've just got here some of the scholars that have uh, aided my own research by their own work. So out of the very many excellent scholars that you see on the screen, whose work on either the Bayou embroidery or medieval maps have addressed the spatial dimension of represented history and offered valuable information into both the embroidery <coughs> and medieval cartographic production, there are a few whose insights have propelled my own thinking in this particular project and you see them listed here. From Suzanne Lewis, Karen Overby, and Dan Turkla, I take the principle of what I call projected historical inevitability. And what I mean by this is that through visual representation and eventual outcome, in the case of the Bayou Embroidery, the conquest of Anglo-Saxon England, is made to appear inevitable and unavoidable and necessary. So Suzanne Lewis, for example, she points to a theological trajectory behind the repetition of fortified residence on the embroidery. Karen Overby employs images and historical context of the two reliquaries that appear in one scene to make this point. While Dan Turklin notes, among other strategies, the imposition of Norman styles of armor and architecture in depicting Anglo-Saxon territory and warriors. From these scholars, among many others, I conclude that medieval historical consciousness was mutable, and space and place could be deployed to determinist ends, whether those would be the conquest of territory and people, or Christian eschatology. And my study of medieval map making has reinforced these conclusions. Um, Emily Albu has argued for the Poitinger map, and again, it's what's this is the Poitinger map, or Poitinger table, it's called either one. Overall secularity, seeing it as a device to promote the claims of imperial as opposed to papal authority over the medieval German Empire. Dan Connolly's analysis of the 13th century monk, artist, and historian Matthew Paris's itineraries, itineraries to the Holy Land, and you're seeing those here, um, are fueled by what he terms translocative thinking a mode of reception that allows a graphic linear representation of space, place, and journey to transport a viewer imaginatively toward her or his desired goal, in this instance, Jerusalem. And you see, this is not actually Jerusalem here. Jerusalem is right here, a much smaller city on his map. Marsha Cooper, and this is the Hereford map of Mundi, 
Marcia Cooper articulates the dual perspectives of the Hereford map of Mundi or world map. The A specula, which is the divine uh, viewpoint as from a watchtower overlooking a territory, and the human and flawed speculum or mirror, our reflection as in a mirror that offers the viewer a choice of viewpoints and an opportunity to participate in divine teleology. I'm most definitely not the first to notice parallels between the value embroidery and medieval maps. Suzanne Lewis noted the embroidery's cartographic nature in her book Analyzing <laughs> its Narrative Strategies. And Elizabeth Paston has more recently likened the deployment of architecture and topographical features on the embroidery to Matthew Paris's itinerary. What I'm suggesting is that all these works betray a cartographic sensibility that transcends the particular medium uh, and offers a strong visual correspondence based upon such things as the strip format in some cases, as well as toponymic markers, and also employs space and, and space to push the viewer toward a desired goal, conquest of territory or conquest of the soul. There are specific correspondences between the Bayou embroidery <coughs> and a number of surviving medieval maps, including topographic features, icons for cities, um, and more. For example, in the Bayou embroidery, specific locations are marked by architectural representations. I'm showing you a series of these here. Um, palaces, churches, houses, and in one instance, a, a Martin Bailey castle. So you see West Edward sitting in Westman, Edward and Harold in Westminster Palace. You have Harold at his retinue entering the Charles Small Church at Bosham and then feasting in his hall at Bosham. Here Harold is in conversation with Guy of Pontua, um, who in his in Guy's palace at Bohrain. This is Bayou itself. Um, here you have William and Harold in conversation in William's palace. And here you have William and Harold and William's army passing by Mont Saint-Michel here. And Mont Saint-Michel is identified in the inscriptions. Um, Paston has recently observed that the architecture of the Bayou embroidery is surprisingly diverse. Um, and it does follow the medieval rule of copying which serves to, and to uh, emphasize certain places as significant and to enhance their authenticity. How this works is, this, this does not look anything like what Mont Saint-Michel may have looked like at the time, but the fact that you see it on a hill, that was a significant feature about it. That was enough to indicate to people that this was Mont Saint-Michel. Um, in some instances, the architectural icons constitute a commentary on the character of the actors or the action portrayed in the narrative. Thus, many scholars have noted that these structures function in various ways throughout the embroidery as designations of shifting power in addition to that of place. Maps proper, both earlier and later, also employ architectural icons to mark place. And you're looking at the Anglo-Saxon map, sometimes also referred to as the cotton map, uh, produced around 1050 and today in the manuscript in the British Library. Um, the, uh, they also employ architectural icons to mark place. So in the Anglo-Saxon map, you see in my arrows point this out, you have London here, Rome is pointed here, and I believe this is possibly Babylon uh, on the Anglo-Saxon map. Here on the Solly or Henry of Mainz map from the 12th century, you have, my arrow is pointing towards a rather complicated church, which one scholar has noted is probably the major pilgrimage goal of the period Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. And there are also a profusion of icons marking place on the Hereford map. I'm just pointing out one of them, which is right here. Um, and also, Matthew Paris is walled Jerusalem. Matthew Paris's map of the Holy Land presents more detailed renderings of buildings, as for example, in the walled Jerusalem here, where you have dome, two domed structures, 
that are labeled Temple of God and Temple of Solomon, um, complete with uh, city gates as well. So you can see the city gates also on his walled um, enclosure. Of course, uh, the bi embroidery palaces also serve as stage sets and reinforcement for power plays between Harold and three rulers, Edward the Confessor, Guy, Guy of Pontia, and William the soon-to-be conqueror. And in the eyes of some, they are also foreshadowings of the Norman's successful campaign to control England, asserting its inevitability. Likewise, in sun maps, such as the Solly map and the Hereford map of Mundi, uh, the Tower of Babel stands out as a marker of human arrogance, and I'm marking the site on both maps with the red arrow. Nevertheless, in both the embroidery and the cartographic works, architectural symbols are employed to highlight important sites. So finally, on the topic of parallels or analogs between textile and maps are the margins of both. Um, the Anglo-Saxon map, for example, includes one of the marvelous creatures or the wonders of the East in text form here. You see the word here, Sinocephale. Sinocephale were, were a group of creatures who had human bodies and dogs' heads. Um, um, they include the Sinocephales in the form of an inscription along the southern border. Later, Mapamundi, such as the Hereford, which you see next to it, display a more expansive set of the creatures described in the Wonders of the East. And you can see them here, a whole line of them here on the coast. Of, this is the territory of Africa. Um, the Wonders of the East, such as the Blemai and the Maritimi, on the Hereford map, these peer along the southernmost border between the Upper Nile and the ocean. The Plinian creatures, because they were actually first written about in the ancient period, Pliny is, is the most famous writer about them, and then that tradition was passed down through the Middle Ages. Um, you might have heard them described as the monstrous races, but that is incorrect. There is no concept of race in this period. They should be referred to as the marvelous creatures or the wonders of the East or the Plinian creatures. Um, these creatures are not fe featured on the bayou embroidery. Um, yet, like the maps, the borders do display something of the fantastic. So you see here winged lions, griffins, and centaurs, along with fables and so-called genre scenes. The role of the borders in the embroidery has been the subject of a lot of debate, and there's no time here to go into the whole controversy regarding their function and their significance. But I believe, along with most scholars, that the border motifs do serve as a comment on the central action and on the characters engaged in the narrative. Many interpretations have been offered concerning this function, most of which depend upon a belief that this embroidery adopts a pro-Norman or more rarely, a pro-Anglo-Saxon perspective. But this is a thesis that's been recently called into question by Elizabeth Paston and Stephen White. I'm not taking on that debate here. Beyond stating that the border image's ambiguity parallels to a degree the role of the wondrous creatures in the southern border of English-produced Mundi, at least as interpreted by scholar Asa Mittman. So traditionally, the position of what we might think of as monsters on the southern border of the Mapamundi has been seen as pushing the other to the margins and protecting the integrity of the center. And on many Mapamundi, including this one, the center is actually the city of Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> but Mittman argues for a more nuanced understanding since among the creatures are human-animal hybrids, or even fuel, full humans who just tend to follow peculiar customs like eating each other, um, problematizing a binary eating. Mittman asserts that, in fact, the creatures on the maps represent a collective identity, which he connects to the Anglo-Saxons or English, who, in, who are in contrast to the circular perfection of Jerusalem. And on this map, 
England itself is pictured down here on the margin of the world. Um, they are emblems of a perceived outsider identity, the English identifying with the marginalized beings due to their own perceived marginalized geographic position, far from the religious centers for Christianity of Jerusalem and even Rome. So is there something similar going on in the, the borders of the Bayou embroidery? Well, certainly, Paston and White contend that the bias of the embroidery is neither for or against either the Normans or the Anglo-Saxons, but actually against the attitudes and behaviors of the warrior class in general on the part of the monks at St. Augustine's Canterbury who oversaw the production of the piece in all likelihood. And if Paston and White are correct concerning the complicated patronage of the embroidery, then the fables and genre scenes target the objectionable aspects of the warrior class of both peoples from the perspective of the monks, who thus locate themselves on the margins or borders, critiquing the actors in the center. Clearly, the embroidery and the medieval maps all display certain common features, uh, as many scholars have already noted. What I have thus far outlined represents a rather literal case for their shared the visual language. And here I want to be clear about something. I am not suggesting or arguing for some kind of direct relationship in which the embroidery influenced map makers or specific maps influenced the design of the textile. This may or may not have happened. And for this reason, at this point in my research, I have put aside questions concerning the geographic, cultural, or chronological relationships of any of the works I employ, but ultimately I must consider those factors. What I seek to articulate now, however, is a more general and conceptual relationship. As, stated, as I stated previously, I believe that all these works share a particular cartographic approach to history. Uh, that is, they employ visual icons of topographic features and buildings arranged on flat surfaces of vellum or linen to chart historical movement. On all of these works, to travel through place and space is to travel through time and to construct history. And in some cases, the Bayou embroidery, the Point Lever map, Matthew, Paris's itineraries, the journey is diachronic, place by place, event by event. In other instances, in particular, the Babamundi, it is synchronic. Different eras portrayed all at once, sharing the same cartographic field making these available as a whole to the viewer. But in all these works, there are shifts, anomalies, and fluidity within all these temporal modes. Let's look at the diachronic mode first. What the bio embroidery, the Poitinger map, and the itineraries have in common is a linear display of movement through space and place, signifying shifting power. The bio embroidery begins with King Edward and Harold in dialogue within the confines of Westminster Palace. And I'm not going to really talk about the inscriptions, which basically tell you absolutely nothing that you really want to know about what's going on here. Edward holds the regalia, symbolic of his royal authority, and commands the architectural framing. Immediately afterwards, Harold, who is granted elite attributes of horse uh, and hawk, travels to Bosham identified through the church here and his hall where he feasts with his retainers. This marks his domain as Earl of Kent. Um, the embroidery continues in this fashion so that Guy of Pontieu is taking Harold prisoner after the latter has crossed the English Channel and gone off course is visually reinforced by the framing of Guy's enthroned figure you see up here. Um, within his palace at Bowrain. And William's control over Harold is signified by their negotiations within the confines of William's palace here. Oops. The mapping of Harold's fortunes or misfortunes has its parallels in the Boitinger map. This map makes a journey through parts of the Roman Empire via its road system. 
And ha as has been stated by scholars such as Emily Albu, among others, it represents graphically Roman Empire building and ultimate control over much of the known world. And Albu asserts that it also maps the medieval German emperor's authority and control in the face of papal assertions of temporal power. Matthew Paris's itinerary, which you see above, uh, in his Chronica Majora, maps a different species of conquest, spiritual progress attained through imagined pilgrimage. But again, it's the major pilgrimage centers of Europe, other important urban centers, and movement along the routes between them that denotes a conquest over the soul. I'll have to hurry up here. So both the embroidery and the Poitinger map are retrospective. They figure events from the past that reach into the present of each work's production, and they employ icons and topographic features as markers of conquest. Um, and what's interesting, as Dan Connolly points out, in Matthew Paris's depiction of Jerusalem, this is both the historical city of Jerusalem, but also the heavenly city of Jerusalem as it exists after the events of the end of time. Because if you read the book of the Apocalypse, the square uh, wall is one of the things that is described as being part of Jerusalem's topography. So this is both present and future melded together. Um, Matthew, both the, the Bayou embroidery, the Poitinger table, and Matthew Paris's itinerary align with Marcia Cooper's notion of speculum. They are mirrors of human action and perception, presented within a sequential earthly temporality of past, present, and future. And along with the Hereford map, this is the Epsdorf map. This is a reproduction because the original was destroyed in World War II. World, War, world maps employ a synchronic mode for constructing history. And so they de depart from a linear temporality, but their oval or circular format does allow for journeys through place and time achieved through markers of important cities and sites. And quite a few of these world maps were included as accompaniments to written historical accounts. Um, much the same combination of place and time has been noted by many scholars of world maps, such as Her the Hereford and Ebsdorf maps, that include within a single frame both contemporary places and place names and historical references as well. Uh, so you'll have, for example, in the Hereford map, you have the cities of England, the, of contemporary, then contemporary England named down here, and up here you have biblical events, Noah's Ark, and there's also a reference to Alexander the Great and the city of Troy. So it all exists together. Um, as I said above, medieval maps tend to adopt one of two temporal modes, diachronic or synchronic, but they engage also in a number of chronological anomalies. In the Bayou embroidery, there are also some chronological anomalies, too, uh, in particular. So above, you have uh, William the Conqueror is, has been informed by a spy at Guy of Con Pontius Court that Harold has been taken prisoner by Guy, who is subservient to William. William directs messengers to go to Guy and tell him that, that he must release Harold into William's care. And here you have William telling the messengers they have to go do this, and here are the messengers going off to guys, and guy, that whole interchange between Guy and Harold is over here. So in other words, in the general left to right direction, suddenly the events are reversed chronologically. The same thing happens here, the death of Edward the Confessor, the first sign you see of it is his funeral. Here is Edward's body being taken into Westminster Abbey for burial hand of God blessing the whole thing, because he will eventually become a saint. Uh, and here you have uh, Edward dying, and Edward being enshrouded. So he basically has his funeral before he even dies. So again, the events are chronologically reversed. Um, the function of these chronological <coughs> disruptions in the textiles otherwise left to right sequencing has been interpreted in multiple ways by many scholars. My interest is really in the flexible approach to time and chronology and history that's evidenced by this visual as an assortment of episodes that the viewer as assembles for herself 
which is an approach that historian Carl Morrison has argued was standard for medieval historical consciousness. All the works under consideration follow this model by offering the viewer an assortment of places and events with which to build a historical narrative without completely controlling that process. And in the Bayou Embroidery, this is accomplished partly by means of its famous cryptic utterances, which tell you pretty much nothing except the names of characters, um, especially concerning the content of the interchanges between characters in this drama of the conquest, and particularly those involving Harold. In addition, the embroidery um, is composed of eight to nine unevenly sized panels, allowing the possibility of reading each as a discrete narrative in itself. What are the maps? Oops. The, the Poitinger table's general horizontal flow imposed by its strip format is interrupted around the city of Rome. Here you see the symbol for the city of Rome, which is encircled by numerous radiating roads. So, Whereas the most of the roads unfold in a linear fashion, they start out in this kind of radial fashion. Furthermore, it presents the viewer with multiple routes, again allowing for a more episodic approach. Matthew Paris's map also presents route options, as Dan Connolly has observed, which allows the viewer to change the itinerary. These routes can be considered the itinerary episodes. World maps are less overtly directional than the Bayou embroidery or the Poitinger map and the itinerary. And they're certainly more loquacious than the embroidery because they're replete with inscriptions, as you can see, concerning the name and the nature of a place or the events that occurred there. It's the visual prominence of some of these icons and the inscriptions accompanying them that allows for their constituting episodes. This and their very openness, uh, bounded only by the world ocean, requires an active role from the viewer. Given the multiplicity of directions to follow and places on which to focus, the viewer must make her own choices and compose her own histories based on prior knowledge of biblical and secular material. Ultimately, both the textile and the maps map visually the transitory nature of human existence the way fortune can change dramatically within a temporal framework, while asserting an inevitable outcome. The Bayou embroidery focuses on the human cause and effect of dramatic changes and reversals of fortune. The Coitinger map and Matthew Paris's itinerary suggest multiple travel options, all of which arrive at a single result, controlled by Rome, ancient, and its medieval successor, or Jerusalem and the conquest of the soul. While the format of textile, the Poitinger map, and the itinerary present a diachronic temporality, they share with maps such as that at Hereford certain representational strategies in the employment of space name, place names, picturing of places, and chronological just, juxtapositions and anomalies. In short, I see the textile and the maps as sharing a cartographic sensibility in which human history takes place within and around markers of place. Thank you. to emphasize the conversation part of campus conversations in Standish. And so if you have questions or like to engage in conversation, please we invite you to do so. Yes? Rachel, where is the table? And can you give us a, a, a bit of an idea of its size? Um, it is in Vienna. It's unviewable. It, it is too long and we don't display it. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I, I can't remember the exact length of it, but it's quite long, so, and it's fragile. So what, what but you can see um, an incredibly uh, high quality digital version that's been a project to, to actually record it digitally, and which allows you to search through it and see various things. So I can give you that link if you're interested in looking at it more closely. Yeah, that was absolutely fascinating, Rachel. Thank you. I've been so curious about this project, and, and I just think it's really exciting. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, 
I'm, uh, I'm really interested. I mean, the Roman, the copy of the Roman map, map is particularly striking because it does have that horizontality and that. Right. Is it intended to be read or interpreted or in, assessed from left to right the way the Bayeux generally is? Um, I don't. I think that it is intended to allow you to decide what direction you want to go. Okay. Because it, Rome, uh, the city of Rome, is not really at the beginning of the map. It's sort of in the middle. Yeah. But that's where the roads originate. Um, and then they go, I'm trying to remember, I know they go f as far east as the Indian subcontinent. Um, and I can't remember how far west they go. But it's, and it's not the complete extent of the Roman Empire. Um, and also, the controversy about this map is most scholars have said that it is a sort of 13th century copy of, of what was an ancient Roman original. One scholar, though, makes the argument that the original was actually Carolingian, that Charlemagne had it produced uh, as, his, as part of his project to renew the Roman Empire, and that it was copied again later on as part of the Holy Roman Emperor's Project. But even if it was a 13th century copy, it shows a medieval sensibility yes, it does. in terms of their response to the cartographic uh, approach. What's missing in it is the uh, explicit Christian content. Um, there's very little reference to anything that would have anything to do with Christianity, which is very different from the other maps that were being produced at the time in the Christian arena. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does have that card graphics. Yes? What were the actual use um, practices for that type of format? In the Asian world, we have scrolls, and there's a whole you know, very dense cultural practices with infrastructure and stables. There's reading a little bit of time in the design period, and what happened in the world of art, and all that, the whole process. How are these extended fictions? How are they used? No one really knows. Um, there are all sorts of ideas about it. Did you repeat the question? He wanted to know how these were supposed to be. You're talking in particular about the, the linear ones, the strip yeah. ones. How are they supposed to be used? Um, there, are, there are theories about the bayou embroidery that it was meant to be installed in a square great hall. Uh, and then you would and that, it, that if you install it in a hall of certain dimensions, certain scenes parallel each other across the space of a room. But there is one theory that says that it was actually meant to be unrolled on, along a tabletop as a kind of scroll, so that you would tell the story, un unscrolling it and wrapping it up on the other end. Same thing with a Poitinger map. There's no telling what its original function was, how it was meant to be displayed. It may have been ceremonial. We know maps. Maps show up, for example, Henry III of England had a world map made for his palace. Uh, they were popular amongst aristocrats and uh, royalty. Uh, William the Conqueror, supposedly his wife, Matilda, had a map in her bedchamber. Sometimes people claim that Matilda actually embroidered the, uh, the bayou embroidery, which she didn't. But so they, they were often used as emblems of conquest emblems of victory or triumph. So they would be in ceremonial settings. Not really, as far as I know, the Hereford map, we do know, it's still in Hereford Cathedral. And it was originally installed probably as part of a pilgrimage ensemble, pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Thomas of Cantaloupe, who was a, a bishop at Hereford, and he was later then canonized. And his, his relics were enshrined there. And the Hereford map, uh, map of Mundi was, was installed as part of a route, a pilgrimage route within the cathedral itself. So you would see that, and then you would go to the shrine and pay homage to the saint. So. Is there physical evidence of hanging? Of the Hereford map? They still have the frame. Um, it was found, I think, in a stable. Um, but they, it was actually installed as part of a triptych and we do have a drawing which, um, which records what it looked like in the 18th century. It was like an altarpiece with the, um, with the Gabriel and Mary sort of at the Annunciation framing the world and it could be opened and closed. Uh, the only part that's left is the, the middle part. The other two panels disappeared. 
And I think it was, it was today it's got, a, it's got a nice installation in Hereford, but it's not its an original frame. started you mentioned there's a tension between the use of tapestry versus embroidery. Um, tapestry is associated with later medieval workshops generally run by men. Uh, embroidery was something that aristocratic women practiced including nuns so in all likelihood although the the embroiderers may have been directed by male clerics or you know a kind of master. It's possible that Anglo-Saxon women actually embroidered this because Anglo-Saxon women in particular were known for their embroidery, their skill at embroidery. So if you call it the Bayou Tapestry, there are only six women pictured in the whole thing. So you wipe out the presence of women uh, and their actual work on this, if you call it the tapestry. Madeline Cavanis is the one who actually raised the argument that it needs to be called the Bayou Embroidery. Although it's been pointed out that the French word for tapestry doesn't really literally always mean woven tapestry. It refers to a whole class of textiles. So, But I call it the embroidery because I respect the women who actually made it. So that's the fact. I would like to say one other thing. Um, in, in doing this research, I have um, I've begun to read more and more about the function of, in particular, the Hereford Map of Mundi, but other, the English in particular produced world maps were interested in them for various reasons, but they all represent a campaign to place England within um, what might be referred to as Christendom. And the way of doing that was to discredit uh, Jews. And the Hereford map is full of anti-Semitic references. Now it was made in around 1300. In 1290, Edward I expelled all the Jews from England. They had previously been imprisoned, and then he finally expelled them. And leading up to those events was increasingly heated anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim rhetoric. So this is something that I have to grapple with. The Bayou embroidery, if you know its history, you know that Hitler was very interested in this piece because he saw in it the proof of an Aryan race because the Normans were essentially Vikings. So he actually captured it. He had scientists study it. Um, and he was going to use it. Himmler, I think, was going to hang it in his medieval palace or castle in Germany, in Westphalia, I believe. So both, all of these have a very dark history behind them. And I think more and more work is being done now to talk about that side of this story. And that is something that I will, I wanted to bring it up today. And it's something that I will definitely have to incorporate into my own study. Do we have time for one more question? Um, uh, on a lighter note, um, I'm curious about your methodology. And when if you- I have one. <laughs> well, when you said, um, I'm not arguing that for direct influence. Right. And I wonder how you do characterize the relationship then if it's not direct influence. I assume that you're not going to resort to the old zeitgeist or um, mentalité, the, the kind of generalizing um, nebulous sorts of uh, ways that relationships such as these have been described in I'm really talking scholarship. about a perspective on history and how history unfolds. So I've been looking at written historical tradition in the Middle Ages, in the Western Middle Ages, as well as visual historical tradition. So what I'm seeing here is the way, uh, in a sense, it is the old zeitgeist. It's yeah. a way of thinking about history that links it to place and movement between places. So that I see as a con kind of continuing thread through several centuries. And 
I'm rela I related, I've just started to sort of think about this part of it, but I think it's also, remember that in the Christian arena, all history is inframed by salvation history. That's what these world maps are all about. Um, and written history is the same way. I mean, the Hereford Mapamundi has a statement on it that refers to, this is after Orosius. Orosius was a pupil of, of St. Augustine, and he wrote a history which was essentially a response to claims that after Christianity came to Rome, it was all downhill, and after Christianity, there are all these, these calamities. And Rosius wrote a history which is actually called Against Pagans, in which he pointed out, he tried to detail all the calamities that had happened before Christianity came, and then, you know, as a kind of response to that. This map is sort of based on his idea, and a number of world maps have been. So this is a kind of thinking that sort of controls how history was viewed in Christian, in Christian Europe. It would be very different in other communities. But in the Christian community, history is always viewed as tele teleological. So it's always aimed towards the end of time and salvation and all of that. Uh, and yet it's also sacred history unfolds in a linear fashion, but it's also cyclical. It's always ongoing. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm working with. Small project. <laughs> Other questions? I'm just curious if there are echoes in this uh, like this approach in other medieval art outside of uh, pieces. Yes, um, I had planned originally to include a look at monumental sculpture because um, I didn't really get into it. But if you know anything about medieval maps. Um, they're based upon, there's a, there's a um, it's called the TO map, and you can see it here. Um, you have a circle and then you have river systems, I think it's the Mediterranean, uh, the Don River, and sometimes it's the Nile or another river that forms a kind of T-shape in the middle and it divides the world into three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, and I noticed if you look at, for example, the sculpture around doorways of Romanesque or Gothic churches, you often have a doorway with a semicircular tympanum with sculpture in it, often referring to something apocalyptic or es eschatological, and you ought, you'll have a lintel with sculpture. It forms a kind of T.O. shape. So I was originally going to uh, include that in my study, and then I, I realized that that was just way too much, and that would, that's kind of a separate project. But yes, I think you do see echoes of this in other medieval visual production. Well, thank you for your attention, and uh, enjoy the food. Thank you. Sure.